Hello and welcome to another edition of the Viva Bastardo show brought to you by the Haggerty Podcast Network. Today, I am super chuffed, which is delighted in English, to say we have Max Buser of MBNF Watchers on the show. What an amazing conversation, such a delight talking to him. We talk about philosophy, we talk about the origin of ideas, we talk about audacity, we talk about our childhood, we have a little psychotherapy session. Uh, it was it was great, so give it a listen. This episode brought to you by Haggerty Driveshare. Haggerty Driveshare is the coolest online car sharing platform around. Renting out your ride on Driveshare earns you extra cash to fund your own automotive adventures while also fueling the passion for fellow enthusiasts. Start earning today at driveshare.com or download the app. Anyway. <laughs> Hello, Max. I'm all yours. <laughs> Listen, man, thank you so much. I know that you have plenty of spare time and you've been just, you're loafing around, just hoping that people yeah. get in touch. With, hey, can some random person have you on a podcast? Because I'm doing nothing. <laughs> For weeks, I've been doing nothing. <laughs> yep. Story of my life. Yeah. So, just waiting for people to call me up. That, and say, oh, dude, do you want to do a podcast? And oh, finally something to finally. do. Finally. <laughs> yeah. Any time is good for me. <laughs> there you go. There you go. <laughs> well, thank you so much, man. Um, uh, it's uh, I, I've been stalking you online, as one does. <laughs> I've got your PIN number, your bank accounts, all that stuff. But aside from that, I feel like you're, you're this kind of... <laughs> Amazing cocktail of John Lennon, the Dalai Lama, and Salvador Dali. <laughs> okay, that's when I start being speechless. Um, I like the Salvador. I look, I look all three. Don't get me wrong, <laughs> but Salvador Dali speaks to me in the fact that uh, I don't have to be humble to admit that being a bit nuts is part of who I am. I um, I suffered a lot of that. I don't know for you. But when I was a kid, I was the weird kid. I was the, the, the one who had no friends because he was really weird. Were you an and, only child, um, Max? Sorry? Were you an only child? Yeah, I was an only child and my parents were crazily in love one with the other. Mm. And they more or less, I'm going to say, didn't notice that they had a kid. <laughs> and, um, and so I was very much alone and weird. And it's a really tough cocktail because you want to be popular, you want to have friends, and it's a time where, yeah, you're shunned and you're like the... I was programming my... My best friend was my Commodore 64, for those who still remember. Oh, that man, I always wanted a Commodore 64. I, I begged my parents because I was an only child too. And just to, to talk about that briefly, I find that the thing about only children is that they tend to have a remarkably rich interior life. Because you're on your own the whole time, you become used to solitude and you embrace this solitude, it becomes a friend to you. But then also it allows you to, I was forever going off into these totally weird places that I was constructing my mind. I was just lost in these things I was trying to make myself, these little projects. I'd, it was, and it was, I, in a way, I, I think that, uh, and I think, look, you are clearly an artist, Max, and I know that, uh, don't have to be all European and bashful about a compliment. I've been in America for so long that I'm happy to accept compliments without being bashful. <laughs> so if you have any, give them to me and I'll just, I'll, I'll just watch me take them with, with a plum. I'll send them to you. Yeah. <laughs> but it, it is, I, I think that, I suspect that's, you know, that's what's made you who you are, is, is that rich interior life and, and the way in which you can disappear inside your own head. Very much so. I mean, uh, for a very long time, I, um, I thought I had a very unhappy childhood. And it's probably the, the, the greatest, uh, what, what sort of word should I use? It, it's, um, it's, uh, le terreau, you say in French. Le, le quoi en français? It's great soil. I mean, it was, it, oh, it the terrain, the terrain. The soil. Yeah, terrain. And to, to then made the, the forest and the flowers, which, which bloomed afterwards. And as you, exactly as you said, I was, I was saving the world. I was a superhero. I still have a superhero complex, which is a bit, annoying and weird when you're 55 um but the um it that's what saved me basically that's what constructed me and then i became a normal guy because then i became very good at camouflage well yeah that's what, uh, what i was going to say is normal the thing is <laughs> camouflage is a perfect word because in the yeah. interior is loony 
But you, what you do when you're when you're, when you're an odd child, I suspect. That, well, speaking from my own experience, you you learn ways in which to to persuade the world that you're actually very normal and charming and and affable. But inside, all the lunacy is still fizzing. That's exactly it. That's exactly it. And uh, and so uh, and then I felt life was a little bit boring. And then I was lucky to fall into watchmaking. That was ooh, a long time ago. I was twenty four. And um, and I found a place which which basically welcomed my lunacy, because it was a lunatic place itself. Because 31 years ago, nobody wanted a mechanical watch, and uh, so we were all crazy nuts, trying to speak to other crazy loonies who actually understood what we were into. And most people thought we were insane. My parents thought, <laughs> my parents and my social environment, like you did what? You signed up for a watch company? And um, aren't those all going bankrupt? Uh, like maybe, but it's worth a try. It's worth a shot. And um, I think Did your parents encourage you. I, that's what instructed me a lot. Uh, and I and I, will, I know everything to to the people who actually hired me there in my first job. Did your parents encourage you to take that job, or were they a little alarmed? But they said, "Okay, fine. Just you know, if you're in, if you think it's a good idea, why not?" I have these. Incredibly weird parents, and I, I and they're not there anymore. And I would love to go back and tell them how much I love them, and I finally understand what they were trying to do for me, because unfortunately I didn't get it in those days. Um, they really let me completely alone to my choices and respected them. And today I realize how precious that is. Yeah, at that time, I would have liked a bit of guidance, uh, but um, when I told them I'm going to go and work for Jaeger Lecourt, they were like. You sure about this? <laughs> I'm like, not really. And they said, okay. You're 24. And, How can you be sure of anything? It, exactly. And I always remember when I, my, my dad passed away while I was at Harry Winston. And then a few years later, I created MDNF. And when I went to tell my mom, who my, my, when my dad passed away, he didn't leave anything for my mom. He had no money. So luckily for her, I had some money at that in those days. And um, I told her, look, I'm, I'm basically going to gamble everything and create my old brand and I'm going all in. And she just looked at me and she said, you know what? When you told us they were going to become the managing director of Harry Winston at when I was 31, my, your dad and I thought you were nuts. And we honestly thought you were going to fail. And you proved us wrong. And we never told you, of course. So now, if you think this is the right thing, I'm sure you'll you'll manage. And that that, that that's I remember that phrase so so well. Just like you proved us wrong, you proved you could do it. Do whatever you want. <laughs> that is the most gloriously European uh, affirmation I've ever heard. I'm sure you'll manage. That's like in England, that would be a slightly embarrassing demonstration of affection. <laughs> I'm sure <laughs> you'll be okay. A big hug. <laughs> that's yes. right. That's right. That's right. So was your mom around to see the success of MBNF? Yeah, that's and she was that's always, fantastic. always, always scared. She was so scared for me. Um, my mom was the ultimate, uh, I used to call her the diplomat's wife, meaning uh, I remember now that she used to debrief my dad every evening. So when he came back from work, she would like quiz him on all sorts of questions. I was often there listening to his answers. And my dad wasn't a very happy man in the last years of his, uh, of his job. And he was working for a big corporation and he got screwed over a few times he was a very honest man who, who kept on getting screwed over by politics and uh, and i realized that when i was all in and then with my mom she did exactly the same she was she knew more about my company than anybody in my life my my ex-wife my ex-girlfriends my probably even my wife at some point she, she she knew more she was all the time quizzing me and um and uh, so she was always in there trying to understand what was happening and, uh, you know, that's precious. That's precious to know you've got somebody who's at least emotionally has got your back. Yeah. I feel like um, I was listening to the something you said in an interview, and it really resonated with me because um, uh, as an artist, I actually made a project about this, but it's about the dictatorial nature of creativity. I did a, I did a project called Kim Jong Phil. <laughs> <laughs> Which is as stupid as it sounds, but kind of weirdly. But but I was really interested to, to hear you say that because it's uh, it's a very unusual. It's unusual to hear people talk about that in the particularly in the watch world. But I think I think 
I think, do you like to talk about that a little bit more? Well, um, it, the, the, the moments of truth arrived when I was in my first job. And I was incredibly lucky to work for one of the greatest people in my industry, Paul Vincent Online, who was the man who relaunched single-handedly the brand called Alain de Zone. It was before the Richemont days, and he was our CEO of Diego La Cosa Nida Lucy. And um, I was the product manager, and I was all the time battling with him because nobody in our company dared battle with him, A, because he was very formidable, B, because he was very smart. He was incredibly smart. And um, and when I believed in something, I was I was happy to go and, and debate with him. And one day, I don't know what, I was debating something. He wanted white. I wanted black for whatever reason. And he stopped. He looked at me. He put his, he had these half glasses on his nose and he put them down. That usually meant you're going to be in serious trouble. And everybody in the room is like, oh God, Mac's going to get fired this time. And he just looked at me and said, Mr. Bissa. He was German. <laughs> Creativity is not a democratic process. <laughs> um, there you go. I was probably 28 and it sort of hit me like, <clears throat> and you saw right. He was so right. Yeah. And from that day onwards, uh, especially at NDNF, way later, is clearly I, uh, I, am, I am a benevolent dictator. You're the Singapore of watch companies. Everybody. Sorry? You're the Singapore of watch companies. <laughs> or the Dubai, if you want. <laughs> or uh, the Dubai. And, um, and so you, um, you, you listen to everybody and then you take decisions. And you take decisions which are the best you believe for the company, and you take creative decisions which are the best for yourself. They are never for anybody out there. Uh, everybody wants you to do smaller watches, vintage watches, black watches, rubber watches, st stainless steel watches with blue dials or whatever. Um, I don't care. I really don't care. I just do what I want to wear. Now, of course, am I affected by everything around me? For sure. So it's going to have an effect on my, my creative process. Do you find that? Um, when I look today at my original MBNF, my very first piece, which was my foundation of, of my story 17 years ago, the piece which I put, the, I thought at the moment the most of myself, I look at it today and I'm like, dude, what was wrong with you? <laughs> How could you even come out with that piece? But it was the first step. And at that moment, it was the most important piece of my, in my life. Isn't it interesting to isn't it interesting to look back at things you've made years and years ago, and as you say, to be completely appalled by what you thought was so perfect? And I and I, I I wonder what you think of this. I find that it's so interesting to me that I can be so sure of something, and then five years later I can look at it and go, how could any of that have made sense to me at that time? I'll go one step further. Over the years, I've tried I've, I've tried all sorts of things. I've I've there are all sorts of projects we've not seen because actually they didn't happen. And every time a project which I really want doesn't happen for whatever reason, I get super upset because I want it to happen. And if I look back two months, two years, 10 years but later, I'm always, I don't feel always going, good grief, it's a good thing it didn't happen. <laughs> so I don't know who my guardian angel, I'm a complete atheist, but I, I think I have a guardian angel somewhere up there or wherever he or she is. And he or she is built like Schwarzenegger and drinks Red Bull all day long because the, the, he or she has always managed to stop the things which I would have regretted afterwards, which is wild. I suspect that that's, I, I always find that, 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 that it's, I think that as an artist, um, there's sort of an internal tuning fork and when, it, when you flick it and it makes the right note, it's the right idea. And I suspect, I wonder if for you, you've developed, uh, when you, when you, the more you create, the more, to go to your Arnold Schwarzenegger metaphor, the more muscular, creatively muscular you become, right? Uh, and, and, the, and the easier it becomes to lift weights until ideas become, generation of ideas becomes effortless. But, but then you also hone that, you hone your, the ability to listen to that tuning fork, I guess. So I'm, I, I mean, I, you must, I suspect, what's extraordinary about what you do, what's amazing about you, Max, <laughs> is there's so I'm many things. Again, <laughs> but is, to, is that you play. Like the, the breadth of, the breadth of um, 
elasticity in what you manifest is kind of is really is is really enjoyable to watch because you're not thank you're, you let's see now it's awkward because it, i gave you a compliment no it's it's it's, it's a great compliment um when I created my very first piece at MBNF, the, the winding rotor was inspired by a Japanese manga of my childhood, Grand uh, uh, which you can see on the photo. Goldorak. The Goldorak. And, um, and I, I never dared talk about it originally. And one day a journalist said, how did you come up with that shape, which had never been seen? It was already a symmetrical rotor. Nobody had done that, or virtually nobody had done that. And, and I sort of mumbled, Goldorak. I was a French speaking journalist. He said, What? Goldorak. And the guy went bananas. He was like, Wow, that's so cool. I used to look at Goldorak when I was a kid. I was like, Really? That's cool? I mean, is it allowed that I'm creating super high, complicated, very expensive works of watchmaking? And you think it's okay that I actually integrate part of my childhood? And he's like, That's so cool. And, and from that day, that liberated me. And that's why, as you may know, our motto today is a, is, a, is a very famous phrase, which is, a creative adult is a child who survived. Mm -hmm. I was a very creative kid. I became a very boring young man trying to become normal. And then probably around 35, I got my mojo back. At least I got my courage back to be a kid and not to take myself too seriously. And coming back to what you're saying on the creative process, you're absolutely right. The first pieces were very complicated for me when you create for yourself. As an artist, you create for yourself. And what the first pieces were very complicated because we're not built. At, at least I had, no, I had no artists in my life. And there was nothing which built me to be allowed to do what I believed in and not to create something which I thought people would like. And then the more I created, the more the easier it was, but also the more addictive it became. And well, because you had success too. Success is a, it, not successful. But I, I would and say that, that. that was good. It's good because if you're all the time successful, you start believing your own narrative. Right. And you become a, a schmuck to not <laughs> say something worse. And and you, you you start your ego inflates. You don't have perspective anymore. Right. You need to be scared. You need to fail. Uh, and, but on the other hand, the addiction, like all addiction, look at addictions. These guys who go and jump off airplanes and skydive and then do wingsuits. And I look at them and like, are you fucking nuts? But I, I understand how they function. They, they first maybe did a paragliding one day or something, and then they had to up the dose. Right. And that's exactly what happens for me. If I'm doing, if I'm doing the same, 20th jump out of a parachute out of a plane, it's going to be boring. I now need to spice it up. And um, so you need to put yourself in danger. You need to feel that adrenaline. I, I often say, like, if you go to the Maldives, you have a great holiday. There's, there's, there's nothing to be proud of. It's a nice holiday. If you jump in a Norwegian fjord at four degrees, you're going to tell your grandchildren that you did it. Uh, and so that's creativity. Creativity is jumping in that ice cold water. It's not being on a five star resort in the Maldives. And so, yeah, you, you, you have to suffer. You have to, you have to bit of pain. That's very European, also. <laughs> you have to. No, no. I actually think it. I think I think generally uh, for the, the, the as I get, as I grow older, I realize that all cliches are irritatingly true. And so the cliche about being an artist and creating art, all those things, they're, they're sadly true. So, you know, the, the, but what's also interesting in terms of what you said about when you were 35 is it, I feel like we are trained uh, from a pretty young age to not listen to ourselves and not listen to what we really want. And so at 35, you started listening to yourself. You decided to, to pay attention because I always feel, I really feel that internally, we always have the right answer. It's a question if you're willing to listen or not. So was there a thing, was there a thing that happened at that age, at 35, that made you go, shit, you know what? I'm saying these amazing things. I'm just not hearing them. There were many. But I also think if you listen to your guts when you're 18, your guts are so influenced by your hormones. <laughs> and so you don't want to listen when you're 18. 
not having experience, that it's very dangerous. At 35, you've, you've gone through a lot of stuff. You've tried a lot of things. You've fell. You've got back up on your feet. You've understood more things. And your guts have a clearer message. And, um, and it's, it's exactly honing that, that thing. Now, of course, in, in my case, um, it's uh, lots of things which came to a head. Um, I had to build my, my, my love of myself up. I had no love for myself. I had a very little self-esteem when I was in my fit one of my teens. My 20s, I started building. So I started building later on. And, um, and by 35, I started realizing I'm not too much of a, I'm okay. <laughs> I'm pretty much okay. And, um, and then, of course, and I've, I've mentioned it often, is, uh, is my dad passing away? Uh, that was exactly when I was 34, 31st of December, 2001, which has always made New Year's Eve sort of a bit complicated since. Um, and, um, and so I just cried for seconds, got on with my life. And, um, because that's what we do. We're adults. We're responsible adults. And, um, and then I realized I'm not over this, uh, because unfortunately I didn't get along with him. And, uh, and then, uh, I had to, I had to work on that. So you work on regrets, regrets of all the things you didn't understand, regrets of all the things you didn't say to your dad. Like I understand, I, I way later understood the notion of language of love. And that is so important. I know if you, you've heard of that, it's so important in relationships. Now, my dad's language of love was working his butt off to try and have enough money for us to have a house, we didn't doubt about having a house, and sending me to private school. And I really didn't give a damn of going to private school. I would have preferred to have a dad who we, had, we were in a flat and I was at public school, but he would do stuff with me. And he would tell me that he loved me, which he never did. He would tell me he was proud of me, which he never did, <clears throat> because that was not his language. And so, of course, I, I, I hated him for that, even though he was a very good man. And, um, and so just if you understand the language, I know now my language of love. I know my wife's language of love. I know my kids' language. They're very different. My two daughters have very different ways of showing that they're, they, they love their, their parents. And uh, initially, you, you want them to have the same as you. And then you have to understand that that's actually you see. Actually, that's that's the that's, that's a, a moment that, of enlightenment. That's an extraordinary. You're absolutely right because, and I find this in myself. But it, it's, but I think we often fall into this trap of because we speak our own particular language, we expect other people to speak the same language, and then we're confused and confounded when they don't say the same words we we say. It just occurred to me, man, that 35 was my date of transformation too. That, what, what happened? If I well, I, yeah, of course. Um, well, I mean, nothing particularly. Uh, I, I was. Um, I had been working in advertising for ten or twelve years, and and, and I finally decided. You know, what, I'm just going to try and be an artist, a photographer, because I'm. I, I was just so tired of listening to myself complain about how shit my life was, and my life wasn't shit. I was paid extraordinarily well. I was doing a job that was pretty easygoing. It was creative, all the stuff, but it just wasn't. I, I guess it just, I just decided to listen to myself. And then oddly enough, my, my mum died a year later and then it really accelerated the process. So, but it's, it's so interesting. It's really, it's really interesting what you say. It's, it's so about, um, it's about listening to yourself, but it's also about the elasticity of being wrong and understanding how people might use different words to articulate what they're saying. Exactly. And then you come to the point of, what is important for you? That's exactly what you're saying. And for me, the most important is the last hour of my life. I've, I've made that the most important. And so whenever it happens, this evening or in 40 years, let's hope it's later, um, I can look back, say, I'm proud of the person I was. I'm proud of what I did. Hence. I can go now. Because the worst thing which can happen is most people look back and say, oh, I didn't do what I dreamt of. I did this. I, 
I, I didn't say I love you. I, what are all these things they didn't do? And then, then you don't want to leave. You can't leave. So that's, that's been my ultimate goal since I understood that, so 20 years ago. And uh, I try my best. I, I don't always manage. We're, we're humans. We, uh, I can get angry when I don't want to be angry. I can get resentful when I shouldn't be resentful. That, that's why I'm not Mahatma Gandhi. Um, <laughs> not Gandhi, I, Dalai I, I Lama. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I'm sure Dalai Lama gets I, pissed off occasionally too. Come on. <laughs> you know, this is actually fascinating, Max. This is utterly amazing. You say that what you talked about the last hour of your life, because part of the process of me thinking about becoming an artist was I, and I, and I really think this when I make, when I want to make big decisions, I think, my, I think about myself in the future looking back. So I remember so clearly when I was thinking about getting out of advertising, thinking, well, I know what it's going to be like. When I was 35, I know exactly what it's going to be like when I'm 45. I'll be a creative director at a big agency making 600,000. I'll have a a beach house in the Hamptons. I'll I'll have the Porsche. I knew exactly who I was going to be. And I thought, I don't want to be that person. So interesting. You know, there are two points which come out here, which is so important. The first one is, as, as a creator, as an entrepreneur, as as everything in life, you always have crossroads. I find so many people don't realize that they actually add crossroads because they don't see the second way. Um, and you've often got one way, and I'm talking as an entrepreneur here, which is, oh, that's going to be easier, going to make more money, but I may not be very proud of it. And that one's going to be way more difficult. There's probably no money in it, but I'll be so proud of it. And that is exactly the, the street I have taken for the last 17 years at MBNF as an entrepreneur. And often, and it was interesting because one of my smartest retail partners, who's an incredible entrepreneur, has made an empire for himself, um, sat me down four years ago and he said, Max, I'm going to tell you something that's going to help you. You have to stop working on so many things which you do, which don't bring money or lose money. 60% of what you do is either not making money or, or actually losing it. You have to stop all of that and you have to concentrate on what's going to make money for you. And I just looked at it and my, my, my guts went like that. I was like, no, no, Mike, you're right. That's probably what I should do as an entrepreneur, but I just don't want to. It's not what makes me proud. And, and actually, that's what makes NBNF. That's what makes my story, my journey, the people around me so extraordinary because we chosen that more difficult, more proud part of it. It's really amazing. So there's so much humanity that, that's, involved. And when you talk that's about, very important. When you talk about this, when you talk about MBNF, there is so, it's almost like um, there is so much humanity involved and almost no talk of hor- horology, which I love, which I find utterly fascinating. It's, I mean, do you, does that make sense? Like you talk, yeah, I mean, so. it, I, I don't know. It's, it's, it's quite remarkable, really, the, 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 the journey, the friends, the relationships, the ideas, the creativity, the, the play. Uh, it's not, <laughs> you're not a normal person, Max. <laughs> I'm, I'm lucky that I've, I've, I've understood things as the, as the, the path goes on. I'm, I'm lucky that my parents gave me amazing values. Um, it's actually interesting because I've only started mentioning in the last couple of years that my mom was a Zoroastrian. I don't know if you know what a Zoroastrian is. So it's yeah. the oldest monotheistic religion in the world. So before the Jewish religion, there was in Persia, the Zoroastrians have got Aura Mazda, the god, and Zarathustra, the prophet. And um, I'm a complete atheist. And my mom just repeated to me all the time, good thoughts, good words, good deeds, which is the mantra of Zoroastrians. And so I was very lucky about that, even though when I was a kid, I wouldn't listen to it. And... Did you see, of course, you probably saw the Freddie Mercury biopic yeah. with Remy Malek. It was incredible. And if yeah. you notice, now that you know that, if you go and see it again, his mom in the movie keeps on telling him the same thing because it's Freddie Mercury was also a Zoroastrian. And, um, and so that basis helps, even if you don't listen to it when you're a kid. And then, and then um, having an interior life, looking at yourself, uh, having a low self-esteem <laughs> is actually amazingly great because you have to, you're all the time thinking of yourself. If you've got a really big ego, 
you're not you're not introspection. You're like whatever. Everything's easy. Um, like life is easy now. I just want to make more money, be more famous, whatever. Me, well, the, 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 inter- the interesting parts of you atrophy if you if you if it's if life is very easy. I think for you, right? They don't. They they wither. They don't have a chance to 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 kind of grow in fertile ground. I guess. I I, I wouldn't. I don't dare say that because I didn't have that life, so I can't know what it is. Um, coming back also to 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 MDNF and the whole point of the journey, I actually thought when I started the company, and what's incredible, we just came out with our twentieth caliber and seventeenth caliber as a movement with incredibly complex engineering feats. And um, and when I started the brand, I only had the drawing of my first HM1 and the drawing of the HM2, which was a final model of the watch, which came out. And I went all in. The idea was, I, I want to be proud and I want to create great products. I'm a product creator. I've always been a product creator. So it was a creating great products, as, as Steve Jobs would say, insanely great products. <laughs> I was getting the Steve uh, Jobs so, vibes, man. I was getting the Steve Jobs yeah, vibes. It was really that. It's like, just, I don't care. It has to be great products. And then you look back and you realize that the products are just the byproduct. And it seems completely corny, but actually the journey is what was counted. All these incredible people I met and who transformed my weird, wacky ideas into reality. Those are the stories I remember. The products are, are basically like, like the photos in an album of your life, but they're photos. They're not the emotions. And, and so when I talk about the stories now with people, they're like, I could go on for hours and like, Wow, that's amazing. And exactly what you said. You're never even telling us about the product of, oh, yes, it's a flying tourbillon rather than it's got a, an hour, a retrograde hour or whatever you want to call it. Because that's, that's, that's I feel like saying today, secondly, initially it was not. That's today, very secondly. So what are those, uh, what's the 60% of things that are useless and not making money and disastrous that you continue to make? <laughs> Um, typically, um, you may have seen that I've, I've, I've created a lot of clocks yeah. and, uh, and then some few music boxes. Basically, it's I, I design for other companies. So the clocks are made by Lippe, which is the oldest clock maker in the world, based in Switzerland. When, when I met them, when they were on the verge of bankruptcy. And I would just say, like, do you want to do my design? And they were just trying to survive. So we said, okay. And it actually... Help them uh, so not only survive but actually thrive today, and we we get like five percent royalty on the wholesale price, so basically peanuts, and and we've made them tens of millions, and um, and I'm so happy for them, but my team initially was like, we're not making any money out of this. And I'm like, honestly, that's not the point. Where it doesn't cost us any money. Uh, it doesn't, except for my communication team, which helps do all the PR, it doesn't take any resources off the company. And it's a decoding machine for who we are. So when you see our, our crazy clocks, which looks like a, a T-Rex rather than a robot, you understand better what we, we stand for, my little chairman, which is behind. And so it was actually, it was free PR. And it got a lot of people interested in our company and our brand. And it didn't cost us any money. So at some point, I was like, actually, maybe we should be paying that company to do do the products. Um, It's our mad galleries. So we've got these, these, we call them mad mechanical art device galleries, uh, where we curate um, kinetic and mechanical artists. We're the only ones in the world. And I call it often an orphanage because all these kinetic artists, and we're not talking of Alexander Calder here, we're talking of other people who, right. who, who, who can't make ends meet because most galleries are just not interested in, in showing their stuff. So um, I, t- I spent a, a really big time curating, finding these people, meeting these incredible human beings who are creating for one and only reason. It was, it's what defines them. It's what makes them happy. They know there is absolutely no money and no business in there, but they do it because that's their calling. And when I meet these people, I feel so humbled and I feel so good because they're, they're people I've tried to go there and they've taken it way further. And, um, and so typically I spend a lot of time on that. Um, 
at some point we we started for example our certified pre-owned chapter where we were um, helping our clients sell their pieces and clients were looking for pieces to buy pre-owned and we would basically lose money on each piece because we would we'd do the free service and refurbish the piece free of charge and take care of all this and basically as my retailer was saying you're losing a sale you should be selling a new watch I was like that's not what it's all about we're helping our clients that's way more important and um and so all these things they've, they've been have you ever considered uh, have you ever considered the idea of making automatons uh, we did actually. did you i love those things you know what i'm talking about for the 17th flop the, you um, know the, the 17th century like the little person writing in the inkwell and they write a little thing on the paper uh, those kind of uh, things. We, we, did a t- we did a tortoise. <laughs> we did a walking t- tortoise. I feel so like you... a tortoise. And, uh, and when you press the tail, uh, suddenly a, a singing bird would come out. <laughs> um, because it, I was thinking of these mm, very big uh, tortoises uh, in the Galapagos, which often had birds on them. And I've seen these singing birds from Roche, which is the only people who still make singing birds today. They're a little bit company in San Juan, Switzerland. And uh, there, it's, it's a very tough world for them. And so I said, "Oh, let's make it that." And and, and it, uh, it didn't sell very well. Most people just didn't get it. But I love it. <laughs> I'm not sure what there was not to get. It's a bird that pops out of a tortoise and sings. I mean, <laughs> yeah, it cost forty nine thousand dollars. And but... uh, and most people looked at me like, "What?" Right. <laughs> it's a it's an automaton. It's it's. it's... It walks by itself, and you've got the wheels and the heads with it, the head bobs and the and the with the and the and the and the, um, the, the legs move. And for me, it's it's magical. And uh, but again, you, I'm weird. So <laughs> well, you do, you, well, you've got the right audience then. Um, I was thinking about this on the. I, I was think I'd be curious to know what you think of this, Max. I, I was thinking about this on the subway on the way over. Um, how really ugly things become really appreciated and, and lauded, for instance. And, <laughs> and my example is the Bugatti Veyron. I was thinking about that car and I was thinking, you know what, at least personally, I look and I think it's really not an attractive car. But somehow, and to quote Steve Jobs, you know, do you remember, are you familiar with the reality distortion field? Of course. Of course. So, so it's like the brand and the cars generated this reality distortion field. And now, and everyone goes, oh, it's a, look, it's a Veyron, it's a Veyron, it's amazing. And, but I look at it and think, at least to me, I don't understand why that's considered beautiful. And I'm wondering if you have any opinions about that idea, if you think I'm wrong, if you, if you, if you see that in the watch industry. Like I see that in the watch industry in particular with certain brands. Look at you. We have similar tastes in cars. Oh, I'm dying all to talk to you about cars. I lo- love are considered, they, they were never successes. They were never, the most, most of them were total failures because they were way too, uh, people want to say in French, uh, but maybe progressive. They were made too different. They were, they were weird. They were, they had no, they were not made to please the masses. And um, and so I just think the same goes in, in anything which is creative and emotionally driven. And in our case, like cars linked to engineering, because I would love to have an idea and three weeks later have a painting done. When I have an idea, I feel it takes four years to come to fruition, four years of insane engineering and millions of dollars and and you end up in, in, in places where you don't want to be and you have to start all over again and all that. And, um, and so, uh, but coming back to the whole emotional part, um, most of the projects, if not all the projects, were, which terrified me because I thought everybody's going to hate them and nobody's going to buy them, ended up being the projects which have defined us. And that's a great lesson. So isn't, does that um, mean that every time you, you think you so do you now think every when you're very terrified, you go, oh, this is going to be a successful project. For instance, for me, for with my wife, I know if she says I tell her an idea and she goes, oh, I, I think that's shit. But I know it's going to be a successful <laughs> idea. That's the marker. Um, I have no idea if it's going to be successful, but I'm pretty sure I'm going to be very proud of it. Is that what I mean is that. It's, it's going to be something that people will remember. Uh, in 2010, 
for a charity event called Only Watch, we took our most polarizing watch, which was called the HM4 Thunderbolt, which looks already like a plane, which was really crazy. And I, I wanted to signal something about childhood, and it was it's a charity which is trying to save uh, kids uh, who are dying of uh, muscular dystrophy. So uh, children with muscular dystrophy, it's diagnosed around three, four years old. They, their own system starts damaging their own muscles. When they're out eight, nine, they can't walk anymore. And usually at 15, they're not there anymore. It's absolutely terrifying for them and for their parents. And so all the brands just change the dial. Oh, we put a red dial, a blue dial, and it's a limited, it's a piece removed, whatever. And I put a panda on my plane, quite had rings, because I thought the only way those child can escape their, their illness today, because there is no future for the moment, is by dreaming. And when I was a kid, like most kids, we dream of flying. And I don't know if you've noticed that when kids who dream of flying, when they become adults, don't dream anymore of flying. So it's, it's a thing very, it's very a kid thing. And, and if you're in a wheelchair, the only way you can actually get out of it is dreaming that you're flying. So I had this whole process going on. And for me, the symbol of childhood was a panda because my little teddy bear was a panda. So I put a, a little panda on it with reins on that plane. And everybody was like, what the fuck is wrong with this guy? <laughs> like, what is he doing? And people made fun of it. Luckily, there were no social media in 2010. Otherwise, I would have been a bit, I've been wrecked. And today, 12 years later, everybody remembers the flying panda. Everybody remembers it. And they're like, if they, people often, if they've only heard of one piece of my brand, it was one piece which sold for charity. Oh, you're the guy from the flying panda. That's what I mean. Well, that, well first of all, that, that to me sounds like conceptual art. And that, and that makes me want to ask you this, which is, um, do you feel like when you design things, they are you're thinking sculpturally, or do you think you're thinking conceptually? If that makes sense, you can tell me um, I'm full of shit. No, I, I I can't put such elegant words on on my process. I would love to. I I, I created a watch called the Bulldog, uh, which we launched. March 2020, I remember that one. And, um, and so it's a, it's a watch I, I, I saw in a half-hazed dream in Tokyo, going from my hotel to the, the airport in the friggin' airport bus at 5.30 in the morning, completely jet-lagged, my head bobbing around. Going, uh, and for whatever reason, I saw this thing. I saw it, it had jaws, which would open and close, which I thought was really cool, and it had big eyes. and. Well, I could actually, uh, that, the jaws could be the power reserve indicator, the eyes could be like the hours and minutes. And, and I started playing around with it half my fault. And I have to say, I don't do drugs, which is very weird <laughs> because I have all the symptoms of a guy doing drugs. And, uh, and so I, I saw this thing. It was at least five, six years before it came out. And I felt very ashamed of talking about this. But I can't talk about this. And plus, nobody's ever going to buy a watch which looks like a dog with opening and closing jaws. And everything. and we're talking about $120,000 watch. We're not talking about $120 watch. And, um, and so I kept on keeping on the back burner and pushing it over and over and over. And, and finally, I had the courage to do it. And I can't explain it. It was horrible when it came out. People were like, well, how did you have the idea? And I can't come up with some stupid half-assed uh, story. I had to tell them the story of me and my boss. And even my team was like, don't say it's a boss. You don't have, you have to say it was, you're in a taxi. A stretch limousine. You're in a stretch <laughs> and, limousine. It was a Maybach. <laughs> and, and it's like, exactly. That was a oh, freaking airport bus. And, right. uh, and, and so that's, that's how it happens. And, um, and to come back to the process. Um, but I guess, I create... sorry, but what I mean is like, do you, do you think of, because I know it's impossible to, to explain where ideas come from. I mean, they're sort of like this, they're sort of like uninvited guests. You're sitting around at home and the doorbell rings and you open the door and there's an idea, right? That's, exactly. But so, but what I mean is, do you see, like, it, clearly it seems to me that you see in shapes, you see in, like, it's almost like a vision you're seeing, but you, so you're not saying, you're not sitting down and thinking, how can I redefine time in this iteration for this watch? You're, you're, there's a, an, I, an image that comes to you, which is fascinating. 
I would love to have this very philosophical, European, profound way of explaining my art, but it's so not that. It, it just pops into my head, and um, and it always pops into my head when I'm basically doing nothing, which is very complicated in our lives today. Uh, and that's why I never create when I'm in the workshops and the office. Or um, I used to create a lot on planes. Okay, so uh, let me let me ask long, you this: a long haul planes. Seeing as you don't know the source of the ideas, it's this un, undiscovered lo geographical location, the source of inspiration. Do you ever get worried that, this, that it's, you're going to wake up and then there'll be nothing? Or have you had periods where there is nothing? It's happened. It's happened and it used to, it used to scare me a lot. There were moments where for maybe for six months, nothing came. And I was like, am I at the end of a cycle? Because I've seen that with creators. I've seen that with people in my industry also, people I admire who sometimes after 10 years, they've written those 10 chapters of that or those 10 books. And, and the 11th book is taking the first, second book and changing it. And I was like, am I there? And then suddenly something happens. And, uh, and that's why I was staying taking risks. That's when I realized that I'm sort of iterating in the same comfort zone. Like, okay, forget about that. Let's try something else. And um, I've, I've designed now a, an espresso machine. I've designed a, pair, a loudspeaker, a totally insane loudspeaker. Maybe my, my time in the watch world, and we've got all the projects out till 2030 now are in the pipeline. But maybe for the moment over the last year, I haven't created any watch. And um, we'll see. And that's another thing which I also have to make sure that my company survives me. Um, I not only because something could happen to me, but because I don't want to be forced at 75 to still be at the drawing board. It's not, it's not a luxury. So um, I'm, I'm working with a, a young creator who was an intern with us a few years ago and was incredibly talented. And um, I'm, uh, I'm allowing him to bring ideas now. He's the first person after 17 years where I'm saying, if you have ideas, he's got mind blowing ideas. And I'm like sitting back going, fuck, oh, man, that's so cool. And um, and so I'm trying to groom him uh, to, to be the next art director so that I have the luxury one day of being able to say, it's okay, I have no more ideas. It's so interesting, I think, because um, I, I wonder if the secret to creativity, I, I think about this all the time, is the idea of treating ideas carelessly. I, I, what I mean is that you, that if an idea doesn't work, you don't cling to it like a drowning sailor, like the, the raft of the Medusa, that uh, David painting. You're not clinging onto this piece of, you, you, you just, it doesn't work, I throw it away. This doesn't work, I throw it away. So you just, so you, this kind of fluidity, and, and I wonder if that's the, it sounds to me like that's what you do. And in particular, when you find you're repeating yourself. Then you're really aware of what you're saying when you, if you, if you find you're repeating yourself, you're watching yourself in a way from a distance too, which must, I think, help. Have you already experienced that some ideas go from idea to reality? I mean, of something you're very happy with, maybe in three days or three weeks, and others can take three years of agony. Yeah. And you're never happy with them. And there's something in your guts which says, ah, and then you change and you change it again. And what I've learned since is I abandoned it. Yeah. Because honestly, I'm not saying that everything has to be a three day, three week process. But when you, you're, you feel that, oh, it's not right. And it's again not right. And, and then some, you, you come out with a half assed thing which you're saying after so many years of investment, we have to come out with it. And also because your team looks at you saying, look, we spent thousands of hours on this thing. We have to come out with it. And, um, and now it's like, you know what? You know, we just shelf it. Uh, again, after 17 years and, and the success we're living today, which has not always been the case, uh, I have that luxury. I have that luxury of saying, you know what, guys? We're not going to do that project. That takes remarkable courage. But also, I guess it's, it's a reflex now. You have, you've honed, you've whittled your kind of creative reflex down to a sharp point. But you're yeah. right, the, the pressure, the pressure uh, I would imagine, the pressure it's to... instinctive. Yeah. 
I would imagine the pressure to put something out when you spent so much time must be enormous. It's, um, it's, I think we all hate, especially these days, we all hate the word waste. Um, and you sort of feel that you've wasted hours and that you have to make them worthwhile. And, and therefore you just push along and, I've had too many examples, counterexamples of that, where at the end, it's never great. Uh, so now you, you can, if you have the luxury of letting it go, you let it go. But also in, in the old days, I was doing one project after the other. And if, if the next project didn't come out, we were bankrupt because we had a business model, which was insane, where 70% of our yearly revenue was products, novelties of that year. So if those novelties didn't come out, or if we had a technical glitch of people hated them, we were dead. And that went on for over practically 15 years. And now it's not the case anymore because we've got these crazy waiting lists of 5, 10, 15 years on our existing products. So we're also coming out with much fewer novelties. Um, but also we've got now four engineers in-house which are, who are working each on different projects at different times. and. And so now I've got, I can say, okay, that one, we stop. That one, we go faster. And, um, and that takes a big, big pressure off my shoulders. Do you, do, are there examples of um, the shrapnel from the disastrous explosion projects, the things that don't work, finding these bits of debris, finding their way into other future watches? That's a good one. <laughs> finally, good one. finally, I've got one good question. <laughs> You've got, you've got, no, you've got absolutely <laughs> great questions. This is, okay, I'm going to flatter you. This is the, probably the most interesting interview I've had in, in, in decades. Thank you. Um, it's, I'll give you an, uh, an example. I don't know if you saw, we created, I created a watch after 15 years for actually my wife and my, my daughters called the Flying T. So I, my whole creative process is turned around myself. This, I, I'm, a, I'm a spoiled kid. I create something I want to have, I want to wear. And at some point in my life, I decided it's time that I do something. And in those days, my whole family was only three women, my mother, my wife, my daughter. The process of creating that product was so long and so difficult for me that unfortunately, my mom passed away and my second daughter arrived. There was always three women. And, um, and I came out with this wacky watch, which clearly there's no market for. No woman would, I mean, very few women would be really interested in this, called a flying tea. And um, the first year when we came out with it, we got all the kudos and the Grand Prix d'Orgerie of Geneva. And it was such a groundbreaking piece. No, no brand would ever dare do something like that for a woman. And we sold 35 of them, which was a lot for us. It was all, I think, most of it was our, our MBNF male clients who were offering it to their wives or their, or their, or their girlfriends. And then the year after, more or less, the sales dwindled. But what happened? In the middle of all this, one, the, the, actually, the, the year it came out, I bumped into the, um, uh, the, the head designer of Bulgari, Fabrizio Buonamassa, who's an incredible gentleman, incredibly creative, and who loves MBNF, and we started sketching stuff together. and. And his big boss, the head of the watch division, I met also. And I said, look, maybe we should do something together. And he said, yeah, let's do it. I'm like, really? Oh, Bulgari, $3 billion company owned by LVMH. You're going to have the courage to work with a micro watch brand, which is not in your group. And he said, yeah, let's do this. And Jean-Christophe Baba sanctioned the CEO to thank him again. And so we did this. Little edition of Flying Tees, redesigned, rejeweled by Bulgari. It was a very big, I mean, we did 40 pieces that sold out immediately, did a big buzz. But that's not what was interesting. It's thanks to that, suddenly a lot of bigger brands or artists suddenly started paying attention to us. And when I came knocking to the door saying, guys, do you want to do something with us? Where before I had the door slammed in my face or not, never opened. Suddenly, everybody's sitting down like, let's have coffee. So that flying tea, which I did for my, the women in my life, and I don't care if it sells or not, I don't care at all, 
actually brought the Bulgari collab, which then brought all these other interesting people to open their doors to me. And there are all sorts of collabs which will be happening thanks to that. So there you go. Speaking of which, when are you going to be doing <laughs> a collab with Ressence? <laughs> Ah, that, that I would love to do. So I've done all the Alain Silverstein, which yeah. is the other colleague in that, in that piece. Um, Benoit is for me one of the greatest watch creators today. I, I love the fact that he basically teamed with Alain, who's both of them are not watchmakers, but both of them have redefined chapters of our industry. And, uh, and Benoit is, his, his personal story is insane as a creator and an entrepreneur, the risks he's taken. He kept a day job for five years in Antwerp. He still lives in Antwerp. And on, on weekends and evenings and on holidays, he built his brand in Switzerland. He went through so many downs that I'm still amazed that he's still standing. And he just kept his, to his vision. We actually, I actually had him, the, uh, I had him on the, I had him on the podcast a couple of days ago. And, uh, and it's, it, the thing that struck me with him is, um, it takes real courage to create a new language that people then have to learn. And, and, and cause you're, you, you, from the outset, you're just, it's, you're cre- you're, you're making your life exponentially harder. Um, and I, when I saw this stuff, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm very glad we have the same watch, <laughs> the Silverstein yeah. one. I'm delighted. But when I, I remember when I first saw that his, his watches, I, I just, it was so interesting and so unusual and so radical. Uh, and, 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 I mean, yeah, it would be, it would really be, it would kind of be magical to see the way the two of you work together because his, his language is so graphic and yours is really sculptural. And I would love to see how those two things intermingle. It's, it's part of the people I would love to, to call with. Um, you know, creating a collaboration is also something you have to learn to you first have to detect all the, the um, how you say, the, uh, the, uh, the messages which are dangerous, uh, because it's, it's very complicated to, to have two creators working on the same object, because both of us have egos. It's two dictators. So first, first, exactly. You've got two, you've got two Stalins in the <laughs> same room. It's complicated. And, um, and so, you, you realize over the years that for a great collab, you first need both of them to want to create a great product. Because if one is interested in having money and the other one in the great product, it, it never works. Second, you need to have strong egos, but not too strong that you have to allow the other one to do something you would definitely not want him to do. Uh, and, um, and third, you need to have great human values because you need to be very resilient and, and humble. Uh, and so, which is not always what goes along with the creative. And I'll always remember my first collab at MBNF. It was with Alan Silverstein. So I, I, I was a fanboy of what he did for years, for decades. And I met him in Singapore in 2007, eight, eight. And for the first time at a dinner, and I'm gushing over him. I'm such a fan. And at the end of the dinner, I said, Alain, would you like to redesign one of my pieces? And he said, yeah, why not? And so I only had HM1 and HM2 in those days. I didn't have much choice. So he chose HM2. And I was expecting something completely colorful, like what you're wearing. So I yeah. colors, and that's, that's what he's known for, this, the, the, the three classic, uh, the three uh, basic colors. And, uh, and he sh- sent me a drawing, which was all black. He basically erased all the sculptural part of my HM2, made it a flat box. He called it the black box. And it was black. There were no colors at all. And I looked at this drawing. Oh, my God, this is horrendous. This is absolutely not what I wanted from him. So I didn't answer the day goes by, two days goes by, third day. The third day, he sends me an email. He said, did you get my email? <laughs> How am I going to call up my, my hero and tell him I hate what he's done? And um, my technical director, is also my partner in the company, itself, looked at me and said, you're going to have to let go. If you're going to ask somebody else to, to modify one of your babies, you, you can't ask them to modify them the way you want it. And I was like, okay. 
So I said, okay, let's do it. And we created the black box. And it was the first really important lesson. It was like, you're going to have to let go. And, and today I love it. That black box is exactly like what you were saying about like what, what, what these, 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 these watches or cars that we love, which most people think, what the hell is that? It's got so much character. So there you go. But do you find, I find, um, I'm, I, when I work in collaboration with people, I find, I, I know this about myself now, that sometimes they'll send me something and I have this immediate reaction like, no, because you've created an expectation in the IMAX, in the multi-screen cineplex that is in your brain. You've got multiple different fil films, movies running. So you've created an expectation of the thing you think they're going to do. And then when it's not that thing, I have this reaction. But I know myself now well enough to say, okay, don't write an email now. <laughs> just, just sit here and then I'll come back a few days later and I will just, again, I will be amazed that I didn't see what I'm seeing now then. Um, how long did it take you with the black box? Did it take years before you saw what you see now? Or was it a couple of weeks later, like, okay, Max, I'm being crazy. This is actually genius. I think it took me to have the prototype in my hand because from a 2D drawing to getting the, the piece itself. And, uh, and actually, the other thing you realize is what's the point of, of doing a collab if you could do it your own, all by yourself? If you've already projected what that other guy is going to do for you, well, do it yourself. Right. And uh, if you're not doing a branding collab, branding collabs are naff, they're terrible. I mean, what is interesting is a creative collab. And, uh, and so it's, uh, it's interesting to have a child from two very different parents. A child from identical twins parents is not very interesting. <laughs> so, so you have to allow that they're going to bring their DNA, which is going to be very different. Again, I'm coming from a guy who's half German, Swiss, half Indian. Uh, and, uh, and so you realize that that's, that's enriching in your life when you take that in that part. You know what I think um, what matters to me in most creatively is the idea of surprise. Because when I see things, like when I look at what you do, I'm always surprised. I see, and uh, two things happen. One is, and, and particularly I find this in art, I look at it and, I, and I'm pissed off. I'm like, shit, I can't believe I didn't think of that. It's so obvious. It's so, and, then I'm, and then I'm envious and delighted that it's so amazing, and I'm so happy to be surprised by that. So do you, this chap you're working with, who, this, this young intern, has he been, it sounds like he's been surprising you. How does that feel? It's, um, it's, it's refreshing, because I need to, ref to, to surprise myself. And, um, and I've been doing it. I have been doing it for, for the better part of these two decades because you're going to see other products coming out. You're going to, you've got HM11 coming out next year, which is a completely new um, design language and a new inspiration. I'm not going down anymore my, my whole psychotherapy child part. I'm, I'm, I've grown up, so I'm, I'm, I'm exploring other stuff, which is really interesting for me. Um, it's, how do I put it? I... I, I, we, I mean, it's not the wow effect. I think a, a project has to start with this seminal phrase is, wouldn't it be cool if? If a project doesn't start with that phrase, probably you shouldn't do it. And it's very, if it's very if it's child lingo, but it's true, wouldn't it be cool if? I was actually going to say, but that it is, it is childish, but it's also perfectly pure. True. It's you. You have to. You have to surprise yourself. I mean, again, it depends. There are different sorts of artists. It's a different sorts of creators. They're, they're creators like the um, Japanese katana sword makers, who are, are going to spend fifty years of their life making the best sword, and th that's that that experience of making it better, better, better. But it's always a sword. I'm not that guy. I'm not in, I, I didn't have one idea one day and trying to perfect it. I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in going down all sorts of different fields and avenues and streets and, and back way alleys. Um, 
but that that's me. If it's already been done, I don't want to do it again. And um, and so you're right about the surprise. And then there's another thing which happened. When I started the brand in the first years, we came out with all these crazy pieces and shocked the world, which was not the point. But now, 17 years and 20 calibers later, the world is expecting to be shocked. So now there's this insane pressure of our tribe of followers, which has grown, who at every launch are in front of their internet going or their WhatsApp or their, their Instagram going, dude, you better blow my socks off. <laughs> and that's horrible because initially when I started the brand, I was terrified that nobody was going to buy my products. Now I'm actually terrified that people are going to be disappointed. So, but the first person, if I'm not disappointed, there's a good chance that most people won't. But therefore, you have to set your own standards very high. You can't slack. You can't let it go and go down the easy way. Because if you're going down the easy way and doing another iteration, which is going to make a ton of money, and like, oh, oh, finally, I've got the easy way, you know that your tribe is going to get back at you. So you can't. They, they will they keep you on your toes. Well, then I think, well, okay. So here's some amazing advice from an extraordinarily successful artist. <laughs> that I'm saying that with total irony. I think that what you do, in a way, you have something, you have an advantage because you have things you can point to and you can, that you've done for 17 years, right? You have 17, you have all these, so you can, you can turn around, look at all those things and say, I will not do any aspect of that thing again. And then the new thing will be entirely new. Like, I will not make a strap this way. I will have the strap be part of the watch mechanically or whatever it happens to be. Like, you, you know what I mean? You have to be like a, a pathological pathological contrarian in, in with yourself that's the one advantage i see in a way you have time, is you have these things and at the same time there's something new which is happening because we're starting to to um how do you say the to um, fit it uh, to um so, to have so, the anniversary like the 10th anniversary of certain right. of our pieces so suddenly i never look back and suddenly i'm like well i'm taking that HM whatever and uh, and or my legacy one which was created in 2011 and in 2021 launched the 10th anniversary of legacy machine so that's a completely different creative process where you take a product which you thought 10 years ago was the best of the best and you look at it with your eyes today and you change it and you create it as you would with the eyes and the brain you have today. And that's really interesting. I do that little, I don't do that much, like little limited editions which come out from time to time. And I, I never had that luxury and I'm enjoying that. That must taking be remarkable. That must be rem products and really re reliving them. That must be remarkably satisfying because as we were saying earlier, when you look at things you've done 10 years ago, all you see is how terrible it is. So to be able to go back and, and correct whatever you think is terrible is kind of a it must be like incredibly cathartic in some way it is and sometimes there's nothing to improve on <laughs> now typically and I, i'm saying that in very hum humbly on by my perspective uh typically uh 2024 will be the 10th anniversary of hm6 the space pirate very honestly i cannot improve on that that watch was spectacular and, and perfect for what it was in my eyes. And I've thought about it because I know that it's in two years and I'm looking at like, the man I am today would still be proud of coming out with that product today. Maybe just and, a different uh, colored, so maybe, just, you proud. maybe just a different colored strap then. <laughs> <laughs> I must say, Max, that your, your, the, these names like legacy, legacy machines and horological, all these things, um, they're so H.G. Wellsian. They're like 19th century Jules Verne, like science fiction-y. I kind of love the way they're almost, they just, they seem like they're, I feel like they, when you hear the sound, the names of them, they, I feel like they should be coal powered. <laughs> they, um, I think uh, um, it's interesting also because a lot of people have looked at what we've done over the years and, and we have, we have created a little chapter in our, in our, in our industry, 
It's a, I don't know if it'll become a current or if it's just a, a one time only. But whatever it is, a great tree needs great roots. And people are always shocked that I love classical watchmaking. And I love the 18th and 19th century clock of watchmaking, which is basically pocket watches. I, I adore that. And um, I, it's, it's an era, again, we, we look at the, always we look at the past with romantic eyes and we forget all the terrible time. And people always think it was better before. It was not better before. <laughs> Life was terrible before. But we always look at the romantic part of what was great before, and um, and so there is a, there is a very much a, um, a part of me who um, who stayed in, in in that 150 year old history, uh, that that time travel capsule which uh, which I had at some point in my life. Do you like history? So, sorry. Are you interested in history? Very much so, and way more in the last 20 years. Not when I was taught it at school, because it was horrible the way it was taught. You know what? What the, the tipping point was about 20 years ago, I bought in an airport a book called What If? And it was a, um, it was 20 stories, if I'm not wrong, of um, military historians. They are, they interviewed them and each of them, they asked, tell us a battle where if the winner of those days hadn't won, what would have been the influence on the world? And it was mind blowing. Yeah. From um, the, the, the Greeks, the Athenians uh, kicking out the Persians at um, uh, what was it? The, uh, the, the Detroit the uh, and all these different stories. Which um, if the Greeks hadn't won and they were at the last end of it, I mean the Persians had an army which were like uh, fifty times bigger than theirs. Uh, Timmy Stocks was the, the, the general. And um, that was the end of Greece. It was the end of democracy. Maybe it would not have, we would not have had Rome, or maybe would have had. And so all these stories of how history has defined who we are, it's not about what happened. It's how it influenced who we are. And I find that fascinating today. So what, what um, because I'm obsessed with history. And it, and, it, and the obsession keeps growing, even as a kid. But it, it 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 grows as I as I reach my dotage. <laughs> it seems it grows exponentially. There, is there any particular period that is appealing to you? Uh, it has to be the the um, siècle des Lumières uh, and and after the Enlightenment. The uh, yeah, it's it's. It's this moment from, from Descartes and all the scientists and um, where we get out of the dark ages, we get out of um, this is what the Bible has told us or whatever has told us. And we start understanding who we are and uh, what we're capable of doing and that man without any divine help could do some pretty incredible stuff. And, uh, and, and that, that, I find that is fascinating. Have you ever read a book called Einstein's Dreams? No, unfortunately not. Oh, okay. If I may, I recommend it. It's extraordinary. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it, they, it's short stories in which each story treats time differently. The okay. idea of time. Einstein's Dreams. I think you might, I think you might appeal to you. Um, I feel like I've taken up, we've talked for almost Two hours now. I feel like I've taken up way too much of your time, man. Uh, I, I, I just, I, I just want to say it was a real joy and a and a and a privilege, man, to have this conversation. It's been so interesting to me. Likewise, it's honestly, as I said before, it's been uh, enlightening for me. Also, we're very, you know, we're very few people have their friends or their family sitting in front of them and suddenly going, "So, why did you do that?" And how did that idea come? So I see it as a privilege to, to be interviewed because it's my psychotherapy de facto. And I'm very lucky that you asked some really interesting questions because I have to think about it. And, oh, I don't know. Why, why did I do that? And the more you learn the why, the more you, you grow. For sure. So thank you very much. Oh, but I'm, look, the, 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 
pleasure is really mine, Max. And, uh, and we didn't even get to talk about cars and all sorts of other things. Uh, that's for the next one. That's for the next one. All right. But again, thank you again, Max. And I, I just, I'm so, so happy to have had this chat. So thanks so much, man. Thank you.